from where I'm standing, I can see down the road the big water tanks at Fukushima Daiichi. And I think we're going to segue here uh, into a conversation with uh, Dr. Ken Bissler of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, who, as uh, we've known for many years, have a good uh, you know, uh, kind of collegial relationship, uh, exchanging information, et cetera. And he has a lot to say about things like the water in those tanks. So um, I guess we can just go ahead on to that, Peter. Is that what you want to do? So uh, thanks for agreeing to talk with us today, Ken. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here, Asby. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've known each other for years now. I think it goes back to 2012. Uh, yeah. And I remember um, because we had been at SafeCast, we've been trying to figure out what's happening with radioactivity in fish and trying to make sense of these complicated spreadsheets of data from the Japanese uh, official testing program. And it was very difficult to make sense of. And then you published a paper in late 2012 uh, that clarified that by simply separating the fish into their ecological niches and showing which ones were decreasing and then showing that the bottom feeders generally were not decreasing. And that was really useful and important. And, and then I learned about a conference at the University of Tokyo some months after that, I think, uh, or maybe right around mm -hmm. the same time. And I went to the conference and I remember I went up to you and said hello and that sort of started off you know the exchange of cards and then that started off and you were always very um accessible and and open to discussion and uh frank and you know uh no attitude <laughs> like <laughs> you know i know everything <laughs> you don't have that attitude that that's really a great thing about about uh, you you can i think so anyway um great. well one, one thing maybe of interest at the start is just i worked for a research institution called Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution outside of Boston about two hours. And, you know, we're basically, we're not, we're not a government lab. I don't officially, I'm not part of a university. So I can kind of do what I want to do. So when things happen, we can respond quickly as long as we can secure funding, typically government grants, but also private donations and foundations. So that gives me a lot of flexibility to say what I want to do, or say what I want to say and do what I want to do. So that's a little different than other scientists. That's great. So it's independent. And that independence, yes. I think, is really important with the right. caveat that, that you have to find the funding. And I know that in this right. case, it was difficult uh, to find funding sometimes for, for some of the research you needed to do. Um, go back. Let's go back to March 2011. You know, you're there, I guess, in Massachusetts, uh, you know, at your institution, I suppose. You heard the news. Yeah. Uh, what went through your mind? Yeah, so like the world around us, we were just aghast at the images of the tsunami, the damage, the buildings, the lives lost, right? That was, my first emails were to colleagues in Japan, are you okay? People in Sendai that I knew. Uh, the second thing you saw were the explosions and the efforts to cool down reactors. Because we knew uh, from some stories that they'd actually shut down the reactors. The control rods were put in place that happens automatically or very effectively in Japan, yet you still have provide cooling water. And those explosions were a response to overheating what we now know as meltdowns and buildup of hydrogen gas. And as that happened, you knew that would release fallout. I had actually studied Chernobyl where there were things happening like this, actually more severe in terms of the explosive release of radioactivity in that case. But we knew there were releases to the environment, and we saw that cooling water being applied and draining back into the ocean. So we knew there were at least two ways radioactivity was getting in the ocean. And unlike Chernobyl 25 years earlier than 2011, this is right on the coastline. So for the ocean, we just assumed there would be a, a very large signal, a release that might exceed what we had ever seen before from accidents like Chernobyl uh, 25 years earlier. So you're really kind of wondering, and what was happening pretty early on, and I'll have to give credit to Japan and the operators, they were releasing numbers, but in these weird to figure out forums, a single press release with the value in the ocean nearby in a unit that I don't even use, scientists don't use. And so we were starting to put those in our little plots, our spreadsheets. And in fact, the level kept going up and up and up for the first two weeks. We were wondering you know, when will this stop? When will it actually get lower? And it took some heroic efforts. That was actually the water, the cooling water being applied by firefighters, emergency personnel. 
getting back in the ocean. It took them at least a couple of weeks to start to slow down that input to the ocean before we could see things going down. So March 11, we all know, was the earthquake tsunami. A couple of days later with the explosions, early April, the 3rd or 4th of April were the peak levels in these ocean measurements that we were seeing. So we had some idea that this might slow down, but we had no idea uh, what the range of different radioisotopes are. Reactors have uh, hundreds, if not thousands of different radio possible permutations of the types of radioisotopes. Yes, there are some that are more common. We call them fission products or activation products. That's why we hear a lot about cesium. It can come out in those explosions. And we knew that there'd be things like iodine, both short-lived forms that are a greater health concern, iodine 131 and longer lived forms. So, you know, that's the type of information that was just really hard to come by. And, but for the oceans, at least made us want to get there as soon as we could. Yeah, so you needed to find out um, what radionuclides were released, how much and where they were going, right? So right. what did you do? So you, you kind of, again, my independence allowed me to kind of drop everything and just start calling up people, emailing people. I started with US government agencies. Uh, I knew Obama's science advisor at the time, John Holdren, you know, trying to put together where could we get a quick response. And of course, that's very difficult, even in normal times with government agencies, the wheels turn slowly. So talking around at Woods Hole Oceanographic, where about 10, 20% of our funding is from foundations, there was someone who, knew Gordon Moore, who's head of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Moore's Law, Intel is the company <laughs> where he made his billions of dollars. And he was investing through his foundation, not at all in ocean radioactivity, but in ocean science, conservation, other things. So the word got out to him that, hey, there are these people in Hui, they're interested. Can you support this? And pretty quickly, it, it seemed like forever. I mean, it just, it, it seemed like forever, but looking back, uh, I got a phone call on weekend that, you know, Gord Moore says, go, I want to help Japan. He actually really wanted to do something for the people of Japan. He knew we could help by going in and making assessments in the ocean because people were rightly very busy on land, taking measurements, protecting people, covering lost bodies and, and you know, basically no damage that uh, Japan suffered. So we could kind of come from the outside and got a phone call. And as an oceanographer, the part of that story is, I plan things three years out, five years out, you know, I apply for funding. I hear 14 months later, two years later, I plan a ship a year after that. I, I picked up the phone and they said, okay, you, you're funded, when could you be there? And I said, I don't know, two months and hung up. And then I was like, oh shit, now what did I say? <laughs> How could I do that? But I, I knew if we really had this kind of support, we could make things happen. And so then I'm contacting other colleagues, because we're all pretty specialized. Someone measures the fish, someone measures plankton, I measure seawater. And so we got that going. I couldn't tell people where the funding was coming from because this wasn't even official till a fairly bit later, but could you be ready in, in two weeks to ship gear to wherever we find a boat? And then <laughs> I had to find a ship. And so anyway, it was probably the busiest couple of months of my life. Uh, six weeks after that, phone call, we were landing in uh, Tokyo, going to Yokohama mm -hmm. to join a ship that had left about a month earlier from Hawaii, Honolulu, to get there and be used then for our research crews. Yeah, so great. it was busy times. <laughs> um, that's great. So yeah, drop everything and run out to get the, Make get it the data. Um, yeah. So um, briefly, how would you describe the situation now? I mean, for people who have concerns about, uh, you know, seafood, marine life, uh, the environment, swimming, surfing, I mean, if you would encapsulate that yeah. briefly, what would you say? You know, uh, the cliche night and day, you know, it's, it's vastly different. You know, the, those first couple of months uh, levels will pick up cesium-137 as an isotope that's very common. Uh, we're over 10 million of these Becquerel units per cubic meter, 10 million, and the number had been one or two. So they were millions of times higher for those first couple of months till they could plug those leaks and get things under more under control. Uh, that still meant we had about five years when things were 
high enough that we had to avoid eating the fish that were there because the levels were too high for human consumers. And Japan from the start shut down those fisheries in the Hoku area, right? Uh, today, we're kind of well below those levels. It's been about five years uh, since I've seen any fish monitored in Japan above the 100 becquerel per kilogram, the level they use for food safety. Uh, two exceptions, one just a, a month ago uh, at 500. So it can happen. A single but fish. Over those, one fish. Over those, yeah. Uh, yeah, and over those 10 years, they looked at 130,000 fish, yeah. something like yeah. that. Uh, so two fish in the last five years above a very strict limit. So I'm no longer concerned about uh, consumption of seafood, which I mm -hmm. gladly eat when I come to Japan, uh, and was already, the fisheries were stopped when the levels were higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and for surfing and swimming, you know, those safety levels, you would have to be in those first couple of months when I was concerned, no longer. Now, right. having said that, I think we have to watch out, you know, every additional source of radiation increases health risk. Mm -hmm. So the risk is not zero and it's mm -hmm. higher than it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have now still elevated levels, particularly close to that reactor in the harbor, but they, they really are concerned for, as we head a little bit south to the surfing beaches or up and down the coastline for swimming, that type of thing. That type of exposure doesn't concern me at all today. Okay, great, that's well put. So in the few minutes we have left, um, what do you think needs to happen with the treated water in those thousands or hundreds of tanks at Fukushima Daiichi? What do you want to see yeah. happen? So, you know, we just had that kind of optimistic things that got so much better view, which is true, I believe fully. Uh, but yet during this process of cleanup and cooling that still goes on, there's a surplus of groundwater that enters damaged buildings from the original accident and earthquake. So you end up building up water over time, a thousand tanks, 1.2 million tons that has to be stored. It is rightfully uh, decontaminated to their best of their abilities with very large engineered solutions. ALPS, ALPS is one of those various generations, but it's not effective for tritium, the radioactive form of hydrogen. Hydrogen is part of H2O, the water molecule. So it's just not easy to remove from water a form of water that's tritiated water. That's the main uh, form of radioactivity those takes. And they've known this, so they keep wondering what to do. But as a scientist, you also know if it's cooling water, it's picking up other things that might behave differently and be more harmful. Tritium itself, it's already abundant in the ocean, both from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing and actually natural sources. Cosmogenically produced tritium is everywhere. And every reactor is licensed and does release small amounts of tritium all the time. 400 reactors in the world release tritium as we speak, as we sit here today. So the focus was on tritium, which by its simplest solution is, well, you could release that slowly and we might not cause harm because you're allowed to do that. What struck us is it took and this gets to uh, trust and transparency. I've always believed results I've seen, but it took them seven and a half years to really start admitting that there were things in those tanks, cobalt-60, ruthenium-106, and our friends cesium and strontium-90, that actually were at some uh, still variable, but sometimes alarming levels in individual tanks. Uh, they show on their website now that more than 70% would need additional cleanup through similar systems, maybe multiple passes to get down to safer levels for release. So what took them so long? We knew it had right. to be there. And even to this day, what, what worries me is the plants I've seen still focus on tritium. These other isotopes are one more dangerous, right. two more likely to end up on the seafloor so they won't mix out into the broader Pacific and become less harmful. They will could stay close to shore, mm -hmm. impact fisheries. And, some and they accumulate, accumulate. Some accumulate. Yeah, and they accumulate like cesium 100 times more right. effectively into fish than tritium. So and basically TEPCO is saying, trust us, we'll get rid of those before we release the water. <laughs> right, and we're going to base that release on tritium. So right. I really want to see a lot more uh, than data from 200 tanks. I'd love to see some independent analyses, even what's in the tank. That's not work I want to do. 
Uh, <laughs> so, you know, let's let's get that information. Then we can make decisions. Let's not be rushed into making decisions because we're running out of space. Mm -hmm. You know, there's many tanks, you know, on that site around you, probably where you are today talking to us. But, you know, there's room around the boundary. You know, yeah. no one's building schools and playgrounds and factories and houses. So let's let's step back a bit, think about what you might do, what storage would have bias. You know, mm -hmm. 60 years from now, 97% of that tritium is gone because of radioactive decay right. without any release. So I just, I want to see a, a few more things uh, yeah. considered in this. To, to uh, try harder to, to, to store it longer would be one option. We haven't really seen right. that thoroughly investigated. They say, oh, we thought about it, but that's, it's not going to work. I don't yeah. think they've really demonstrated that. And, and other things need to be, we need to see a plan, right? Uh, to, to how it's going to be verified, you know, who's going right. to check what and where, what third parties will be involved. Otherwise, not only right. will no one trust it, um, you know, we won't really have the knowledge that we need to have, uh, confirmable knowledge that we need to have. I'm just thinking so, about it over the years too, but coming from the outside and being independent, it, we're not making nearly the number of measurements as the TEPCO or the government agencies or Japanese scientists, right? right. I, I don't live there. I don't work there all the time. But by having some independent confirmation when you come in, you can really build some more trust that what you are seeing is correct data-wise and that is being done properly. So I think, you know, there's a value for making some of these analyses in the future and ongoing. Yeah. Uh, from outside groups. And even when the levels are low, it's good to know that. So keep doing this. Right. Don't, don't give up, especially when you have a thousand tanks sitting there with right. high levels of radioactivity in them. Yeah, great. Well, um, yeah, it's been a great conversation, Ken. And, uh, you know, I always look forward to it. And, um, you know, as much as we should talk about, we didn't get to talk about um, your citizen right. science project, um, Our Radioactive Ocean, where you enlisted the help of uh, people up and down the Pacific coast to, to gather water samples. A great project that filled in a lot of gaps in the data. Um, it, citizens can do this stuff. Maybe there's a role for citizens in monitoring uh, any potential future release of this uh, treated water, for instance. Um, I'd exactly. like to see those plans discussed and somehow recognized uh, by government and by, you know, uh, TEPCO and others. So um, yep. anyway, yeah, uh, it's great to talk to you. So um, yeah. it's been 10 years, so maybe interest will wane from now, but, um, you know, I know your work uh, will continue and as yeah. will the work of the other scientists. So um, no, I hope luck. it continues and we can still have these conversations and yeah. pretty soon after this COVID, yeah. COVID challenge, I can get back to uh, join you in Tokyo again. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, and I would like, I've never been to Woods Hole. I look forward to visiting there sometime. There you go. You're invited. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot and take care. Bye. Okay. Bye.